Okay, welcome to Lord Mayhem reading. Uh, we are 1527 of the online version, year 1933. Uh, Eva, would you like to start? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Right. Evening. Okay. Ruano's tears purified her heart and set it afire which made her completely Baba's forever. Which is where we left off. Uh, that was a story about Ruano's first meeting with Baba. Okay, pick it up from here. Okay. In the evening of 9 July, 1933, Quentin, Margaret, Mabel and Delia staged a skit, which Baba had asked them to prepare while he was away in Rome. The theme of the performance was what Baba had often repeated to them. If you find me a perfect boy, I will break my silence. They had therefore created a skit in which all of them were old people now and such a boy had finally been found. Quentin dressed in a, leather, a feathered hat a coat and shorts, but a cable from Baba was received, delivered by Kaka, dressed as a mailman, saying everything was postponed owing to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. This caused them to faint, and as they did so, pledge, we still have faith. After the skit, Margaret and Quentin danced with an umbrella in a takeoff of Meredith and Margaret Starr. And Mabel, Anita, and Delia did an imitation of an African chieftain and his tribe. Baba was highly amused. One afternoon, as they were sitting with Baba outside on the cliffs, talk of past lifetimes came up. Minta naively claimed to have been Lord Krishna's consort, Radha. Narina thought that she herself may have been Mary, the mother of Jesus. Others claimed various lives, but Baba did not indicate who they once were. Referring to this occasion, Margaret once recalled Fortunately, no one claimed to be Cleopatra that day, thank goodness. She actually thought the whole thing was ridiculous and joked, Baba, I do not want anything from any past. What I want in the present is to be your fiance. I oh. would like to be your fiance, but I will never ask for marriage. I will remain your fiance forever. Baba was delighted and gestured that what she said was very good. <laughs> Margaret was deeply touched when a few days later, Baba took an Egyptian scarab ring out of his pocket and slipped it on her finger. She never took it off. And for years afterwards, would sign her letters to Baba, Thomas's fiance. Thomas was the little boy whom Baba pretended to be, who had come to her for dance lessons the previous year in Santa Margarita. Monday, 10 July, 1933, was the eighth anniversary of Meher Baba's silence. For the Westerners, it was a day of great experience in the ways of the master's work and powers. After tea, Baba took about 15 of them for a walk along the cliffs, informing them, we will get good exercise today, climbing up and down the cliffs, which I always like to do whenever near them. So remember, be with me wherever I go. Stay with me and don't get separated. Keep together. 
After looking at the beautiful Italian sky, Baba took, took them down a steep cliff to the sea. They were all together up to a certain point, but then some began to lag behind due to their usual chatter. At the last descent to the sea, some stayed back because the incline was too steep and dangerous. Only Baba, Herbert, and Vivienne reached the bottom. When Baba did not see the others, he loudly clapped for them to join him. Anita came fast and the others tried to follow slowly, but they could not make it down. Quentin suggested they turn back. So the others retraced their steps, rejoined Quentin and Mabel at the top and returned to the villa. Instead of returning the way they had come, Baba said they would take a shortcut and he began climbing back along another ridge. Nimble and light-footed, Baba scaled the smooth rocky surface and Herbert, Vivienne and Anita had no choice but to follow. Baba was gentle with the young ladies, helping them over the difficult spots by stretching out a hand to pull them up. Herbert thought that this venture was symbolic of following the master under all circumstances, even in the face of danger. And, the, and he boldly climbed upward, confident of Baba's protection. Halfway up, however, they realized they were stuck along the cliff. There was no clear and easy path to the top. Baba and Herbert tried several maneuvers, leaving the ladies to wait, but there was nothing but sheer rock, rock face above them. And both sides had an almost straight drop to the sea. Herbert attempted one climb for nearly 20 minutes hanging on to roots and branches as he did so. His heart beat wildly, but his efforts were futile. There was one small path, but a big rock overhang stuck out 15 feet, blocking the way. Baba attempted it and scampered up, scattering earth behind him. He clapped his hands for Herbert to follow and then disappeared out of sight. Baba's last signal had been for them to come up. So Herbert told Vivian to come. She tried valiantly, but her strength was slowly ebbing. They were too scared to look down and shouted to Baba for help. Herbert was gradually slipping from his precarious perch where loose dirt and slippery moss covered, covered the rock. Any movement would have pushed down earth and rocks into the face of Vivian, who was clinging desperately to a depression in the rock and pressing her body to the smooth surface, unable to move. Anita was below her trying to hold steady. The others had returned to the villa and were surprised that Baba's group had not returned after two hours. Meanwhile, Baba had climbed up a higher cliff and was clapping his hands loudly to attract attention. Since he was at least a mile from the house, no one there heard him. But an Italian priest walking past saw him and knew where Baba was staying. He ran to the house and told the Italian boy Tino. Tino ran to Baba and understood his hand signs to bring ropes. He rushed back to the kitchen and told Kaka, Adi Jr., and Pendu, who were cooking the evening meal. Leaving the pots on the stove, 
they immediately left with the rope. By the time Vivienne, by this time, Vivienne was terrified and shouting at the top of her lungs, Baba, Baba. She could not let go. As she would fall 15 to 20 feet onto Anita and then roll down another 300 feet to the sea. Also growing anxious, Herbert tried to reassure her that help was coming and to hold on. Anita was more perplexed than afraid and wondered how on earth this could have happened on a walk with Baba. The line, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a hero only once, kept going through her mind. Pendu then appeared at the top of the cliffs with a rope. He tied the rope to a tree. Baba began climbing down, down it, and Pendu followed him, dropping pebbles on Baba as they descended. The rope wasn't long enough to reach those stranded, so Pendu went further down and it extended his arm to pull Herbert and Vivian up. Pendu then slid further down the side of the cliff and told Anita to grab his leg, which she did, and she, was, and she too was rescued. Anita recounted, what was amazing was Baba's tremendous beauty. It was as if I saw for the first time what beauty was. As I was being pulled up, Baba looked at me and there against the sea, against the cliffs, against the sky was Baba, like a tremendous Byzantine figure and with the most beautiful smile. And at that moment I thought, never again will I see beauty like this. Baba scolded the group. Again, you broke my order. I told you all to be with me. Why did you leave? They said Todd had told them to, and Baba retorted, if Todd is your master, then go and follow him. Why are you staying with me? Didn't I tell you to keep close? Why didn't you ask me if you could leave? When I give you an order, you must always obey it. Back, back at the villa, Baba's mood changed and he seemed to enjoy the excitement of this spice of danger and was as happy as a schoolboy. As Anita described it, he appeared positively radiant. He called all into the library and narrated the adventure. With his own hands, he served a glass of wine to Herbert, Anita and Vivian and commented, I wanted to give this experience to all of you but some did not stick with me as I had repeatedly warned. To be with me and to die according to my wish is real living. I have done great work through this adventure. The energies expended, the feelings aroused and the courage displayed were utilized by me in my spiritual work. During his stay in Portofino, Baba received invitations from a number of ardent admirers in Europe to visit their countries. As related, various individuals had been contacted in Italy, France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Romania by Norina and Quentin. To visit each country would take a long time, and Baba was now anxious to return to India. He canceled any plans to visit other countries and decided instead to stay in Italy to work. He did, however, 
allow visitors to come to Portofino and see him. A few persons like Ruano and Hetty mm -hmm. were allowed to stay in town and come to the villa every day during fixed visiting hours. Baba spent most of his time being attentive to his birds. In these chosen ones, he was creating a thirst to drink more and more of his wine. One visitor was the Indian philosophy student from London, C.D. Deshmukh, after mm -hmm. complete, what is the Deshmukh, is that right? I think so, yep. Okay, after his doctorate, Deshmukh came to see Baba and stayed for four days. He asked Baba, what am I to do now? Smiling, Baba replied, just be sure not to forget me. Baba told him to seek employment with the remark, look for a job in a university but with the conviction that you do so in order to fulfill my instructions. I am always with you, but you must always keep me with you. Deshmukh was well-read and having been influenced by Krishnamurti's writings, asked Baba, is it not possible to progress on the spiritual path without the aid of a guru? guru? Baba answered, bandage your eyes and then go find Adi and bring him here. Adi Jr. was in the next room. So Deshmukh asked, how can I find him while blindfolded? First, blindfold yourself, Baba instructed. Deshmukh hesit hesitatingly tied a scarf over his eyes and Baba motioned to Chanji to lead him to Adi Jr.'s room. Okay, thank you, Eba. You're uh, welcome. Moni, would you like to read? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I said I'm recording. On the top, accordingly. Yeah, okay. Accordingly, Chanji did so, and Deshmukh returned to Baba, who asked, Why couldn't you go to Adi's room alone? I was unable to find the way, blindfolded, he said. So, you needed the help of one who knew the way. Yes, I suppose, Deshmukh acknowledged. Baba then elaborated. In the same way, you will not be able to find the path. You're blindfolded by illusion. If you want to traverse the path, you will have to seek the aid of one who knows where to find it. Else, you will wind up mean daring here and there probably breaking your head and both legs <laughs> in the process you will gain nothing baba's clarification freed deshmukh of his misconception and baba jokingly asked can you not understand such a simple thing you doctor of philosophy or is it your philosophy that is confusing you? Four days later, Deshmukh returned to India and immediately got a job as a professor at Morris College near Nag I mean at Nagpur University. While conversing with the Westerners in the villa one day, Baba explained to them about the minor advent in Portofino that had occurred on the hill where Alta Chaira had been built. Some centuries ago, as a master, unknown as I often incarnate, 
I came to Portofino with some of my circle, including some of those who are with me now. In those days, there were no houses or buildings in Portofino as there are now, but there were some huts, a couple used to come daily to this hill where the villa is built, seeking privacy. Stay for a long while and then go away. One day, I happened to go Upon seeing me, the man got annoyed. But I went nearer and sat close by. He got angry and gave me a slap. I did not say anything, but walked off quietly. One of you who was with me then was so enraged at hearing this that you went up the hill and found the couple sitting there. The man again got angry and a fight ensued. In the struggle, you neared the edge of the cliff. The women helped her husband and they both threw you over the cliff. The women, the woman helped her husband and they both threw sorry. Uh, they both threw you over the cliff. Anyone else would have died, but not one of mine. He was saved. This excited another of my disciples to whom alone I had told the story. He went up the hill the next day, but he did not. Mari, you went mute all of a sudden. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, this excited another of my disciples to whom alone I had told the story. He went up the hill the next day, but he did not find the couple. I had read that. Next page, please. On the following day, he and the one saved returned together and found the man and his wife there. The man got into a terrible, violent struggle with my two men and was seriously wounded. Because of the adventure on the cliff the other day, I remember the incident from ages ago. Footnote. Baba also wrote to William Duncan that Portofino has many past connections with me and my work. He gave no further details of his minor advent in Portofino or about any other minor advents, although he told some of the early Mandali that he had been the Indian warrior king, Shivaji. On one occasion, a person in the group questioned Baba about lust. Their conversation follows. It has been said that by fighting lust, one can develop true love. But you teach that by developing true love, one can break away from lust. Baba replied, the method of love is direct. The other method is indirect and roundabout. It is like eating by reaching your mouth with your hand around your neck. When I meet a young woman, the devotee said, undesirable thoughts come into my mind. Yet, when I avoid them altogether, I feel that I'm holding back my development. Is there any way out of this dilemma? Free mixing of the sexes, as is done in the West, is good on the whole. But if the aspirant feels the slightest flutter, of impure thoughts within his mind, he should stand aside. But he must love. In order to avoid such thoughts, he should keep the thought in mind that he is to love me in the other person. The man then asks, can one express and develop love through sexual intercourse? Baba answered, 
if you think that you are expressing through the sex act, you are sadly mistaken. It is lust which prompts you to engage in it. It is not possible to express pure love through sexual intercourse because of the clash of impressions and scars involved therein. During this day in Portofino, the chairman of the World Fellowship of Faith sent Baba an invitation through Strokes to sorry through Strokes to attend their conference being held in Chicago from June to November 1933. Footnote, please. Footnote: The chairman's name was Bishop Francis McConnell. And he was writing at the suggestion of one of the other executives of the organization who had met Baba at the Stokes's the previous year. Not only is he, Baba, a great man, Das Gupta wrote, but he is also a great leader of the Zora Shiv faith. Letter from June 1933. Baba sent a telegram that he would decide when he returned to India and let the man know. Meanwhile, murdered star, who had turned further away from Baba, wrote a letter to Sampat Ayangar in July 1933 and detailed why he had left Baba. I can no longer follow Baba and desire to serve my connection with him completely. I had my doubts when Baba was in Chal Chalakombe and I now sure of them. My reasons are as follows. Next page, please. Thank you. First, Baba is not a perfect master nor a desirable teacher. Second, Baba makes promises like an irresponsible child and it is quite impossible to trust his word. For example, he could not speak in America last July. Third, he has made all kinds of promises to me and others without attempting to keep them. Fourth, According to Western standards, his conduct with women has been extremely undesirable. He deliberately encourages hysteria in women. Fifth, he traveled in China with a European boy, Carl Philip, which gave rise to scandal. He has become the laughing stock of the newspapers. His Western followers are mainly hysterical women. He has practically no appeal to serious men. And frankly, he is regarded in America as an undesirable adventurer. Sixth, I have rarely seen a person more restless than Baba. Seventh, I have repeatedly seen him flattering the most impossible people just because he wanted to get money or other help from them. He told them so and would laugh at them behind their back. The first time he went to America, his only thought was to get money. He told me that he knew he was acting against the great law. To my mind, these are serious personal ch charges. Baba claims that he intends to do all sorts of wonderful things. In spite of the, all these journeys, he has done practically nothing and spent some $7,000 nearer than 10,000. Sorry, pounds. That's pounds, right? Yeah. Right. He owes me four pounds. He has frequently promised to replay it, but definite dates, by definite dates, but he has not done so. It was all I had. If you see him, please ask him to repay it. If not. Dick Ince sided with Meredith Starr in turning against Baba and demanding repayment of money from him, even though the amounts had been given as gifts to Baba for his work. Well, even though his claims were ridiculous, Mordeth was complained to Scott Lindyard. But when an investigating inspector came to talk to Margaret Kraske, he candidly admitted that Scott Lindyard had found nothing against Meher Baba. Murdered Star understood so little of Baba's ways, but for Baba's own reasons, Murdered was the first link between the East and West. Whatever his faults, he always will be remembered as such. Footnote. 
A year later, on March 1st, 1934, Baba sent a cable to Herbert, instructing him to send Meredith Starr a legal notice for defamation and to threaten further legal action by Rustum if Meredith continued to trouble Baba and his followers. Meredith Starr died in England in 1971. His occupation at the time of his death is noted as, quote, psycholo psychologist and retired homeopath. When the editor contacted his wife, Margaret, in 1981, she wrote back, we found the truth we sought elsewhere and have had no regrets. In the 1950s, they became associated with the Subud, S-U-B-U-D movement. Okay. Okay, thanks, Mona. Oh, we, we have a little thanks. bit more here. I'm, I'm going to pick up the reading for a little while. Uh, Minta was de delegated to bring Baba's food from the kitchen to his room. And whenever the group was sitting with Baba, Minta's place was next to him as she would keep his alphabet board handy. Once, while the Westerners were sitting with Baba upstairs, Minta left the room momentarily and another girl took her place by Baba. When Minta returned, she gestured for the person to move, but the girl refused. Minta stormed out and went downstairs to the kitchen. Penda was doing night watch duty for Baba, as well as helping Kaka prepare Baba's food. He and Kaka were in the midst of cooking when Minta suddenly appeared and sat down. Minta had been told only to collect the food and not spend time visiting. Although Pendu tried to dissuade her from lingering, she would not listen and stayed. It was Baba's strict order that the Mandali not be alone with the Western women outside of his presence, and vice versa. Baba once warned the men in regard to the women not too near and not too far. While Minta was sitting in the kitchen, Baba came looking for her and immediately took both Pendu and Kaka to task in Gujarati. Pendu argued, Baba, it is not our fault. We told her to leave, but she would not listen. Baba was very angry and replied, you know my order. If she would not leave, you should have left. Why were you talking to her? Couldn't you ignore her? Baba severely reproved them. Mint admitted it was her fault and they were not to blame. Baba left the kitchen with her. Later that night at dinner, referring to the incident, Adi Jr. said to Baba, we have been with you for years and you still do not trust us. You still have no faith in us. Todd enters the girls' room every day and talks with them, but you don't say anything to him. Baba called the Westerners to the dining table and explained to them about obedience. Look at my mandali. They always do as I tell them. They would not break my order even if their lives depended on it. They labor day and night to please me. But when you cannot be attentive to such a small thing as to not be alone with them, what sort of love do you have? These boys, my mandali, know how to obey me. And you think I don't trust them? I trust them 100%. I want you to learn how to obey my orders. Compared to my mandali in this, you are nowhere. Baba's rebuke left a deep impression upon the Westerners. They were to understand that the song cannot be sung to just any tune. It can be sung only to the tune set to obedience to the beloved. On Monday, 17 July, 1933, a German poet came to see Baba. Explaining to him about freedom, Baba narrated the following tale that ended with a few riddles to which Baba did not reveal the answers. There were two birds, a male and a female, who were always together. They were quite independent and would fly wherever they liked. They were always free, but they did not know what freedom was. One day a man caught them both and put them in a cage. The male bird began beating his wings against the bars of the cage hoping he could force his way out, but he gradually lost all his feathers. Subsequently injuring his wings, he became nearly unconscious, but the female bird was intelligent. She saw how foolish it was to try to break through the doors with the beating of her wings, and she remained quiet, 
patiently waiting for the cage door to open. She saved herself from injury because she wisely remained calm. After a long time, the door was eventually opened and the pair flew out. The moment they were free, they realized what true freedom meant. They knew the pangs of suffering caused by their lack of freedom. Because they had been caged, their subsequent freedom had meaning. The female bird flew away, but the male could not fly well because of a broken wing, and he was eaten by a cat. Now tell me, who was the man caged? Tell me who was the man who caged the birds? Who were the birds? Who was the cat? Try to grasp the meaning of this riddle and compose a poem about it. The next day, 18 July, in the dining hall of their villa, Baba spoke about the work of the perfect master and the avatar not being understood by everybody, citing an incident from the Mahabharata of Krishna and Arjuna. If you read the life of Krishna, you will find that he often said, did, and ordered things which seemed to go against common sense. He would tell one thing to one person and contradictory things to another person. And he would give difficult, different orders to different people at the same time. Krishna used to bluff, lie, and do all sorts of strange things for the upliftment of humanity. He was perfect and one with God and so found himself in everything and in everyone. He had to use different methods for different things and people. I have to use Maya to draw my disciples out of Maya. The West does not understand this, but the East understands it. That is the difference in the mental attitude between the East and the West, where there is no self-interest and no selfish motive but only the motive of doing good for others, whatever one may do, there are no sanskaras and no binding sanskaras. I have to use infinite ways for my infinite workings, all different and all at different times. When Krishna ordered Arjuna to kill the Karavas, Arjuna hesitated and then refused, asking Krishna, how can I slaughter my own kith and kin? Krishna said, do as I tell you. But Arjuna would not listen. And Krishna said, look into my face. And he opened his mouth and Arjuna saw in it all his brothers and relatives whom he had not wanted to kill. Arjuna saw that Krishna's mouth contained the whole universe, including millions of Parabas who looked like clouds, but then vanished from sight. Krishna showed him his universal body, which contained all living and inert forms. To see this is called Bharat Darshan, gigantic sight. This is not real Darshan. It is only the Darshan of the master's universal body. The avatar also has a universal mind to which all the individual minds in the universe are connected. This then convinced Arjuna of Krishna's mighty powers, and he plunged into battle, killing many. Krishna told him, if you had had full faith in me, you would never have doubted or asked questions. And then he delivered the lecture, which is now known as the Bhagavad Gita. From this example, you will come to know that even the closest disciples of a master misunderstand his way of working. To convince and create faith in them, masters have to resort to performing miracles. That is why Krishna did what he did. Implicit faith and abject obedience to a master is the shortest, quickest, and easiest way for attainment of God realization. Baba continued by giving another example of a disciple's love and faith Swami Ramdas, who was a perfect master and Shivaji's guru, once placed a mango on his own leg and wrapped it in a bandage. He called his followers to him and pretended to be in great pain. Through clenched teeth, he told them, I have a very bad boil on my leg, which has become septic. It is full of pus and pained me terribly last night. I could not sleep at all due to the pain, and I am at a loss as to what I should do now. 
Ramdas seemed to be writhing in agony and suffering acutely. When his mandali suggested various treatments, he remarked, nothing will help, but if someone were to suck out the poison, only then would I recover. But the pus is poisonous, and he who does this will die. Hearing this, all hesitated, except for Kalyan, the master's favorite disciple, who stepped forward and began to suck at the, quote, wound, end quote. To his great surprise, he tasted mango juice. Ramdas just demonstrated to his hesitant disciples the love and faith that Kalyan had for him. Okay, I think I'll give someone else a chance. Rosalie, would you like to pick up the reading here? Yes. Uh, where are we? Right at the top. Top, okay. Baba then told another story about Swami Ramdas and Kalyan, which illustrated obedience. One day in broad daylight, Ramdas, saying it was dark out, told Kalyan to bring a, lantern, a lighted lantern, which he did immediately. Ramdas slapped him for this and said, you fool. Can you not see it as daylight? Kalyan apologized, asking his forgiveness as he left with the lantern. By using this example, Ramdas explained to Shivaji about faith and obedience. Hafiz has said, whatever my master says, I accept wholeheartedly without the slightest thought. This is the implicit faith and abject obedience. But it is very, very difficult, rather impossible, particularly for you Westerners who have so much intellect, always arguing the merits and demerits of things. In Kalyan's case, he not only obeyed his master's orders, but he actually believed Ramdas when he told him it was the darkness of night, even in broad daylight. Such belief and faith is truly impossible. Delia inquired, does this mean we shouldn't think or make use of our intellect? Baba responded, not a bit. You may use your intellect, but not at the cost of disbelieving my words or disobeying my orders. You may think for as long as you have a mind, you have to think. Your mind never stops thinking. It will tell you that if, it will tell you that it could not be night when your eyes see daylight. So remember not to let the mind lead you to disbelieve in the master's words. You must think and understand that there is some important reason and purpose behind whatever the master says or does, and that he always does, does it for the benefit of others. Whatever he does is always for the best. So do as the guru tells you and let the mind think as it likes, but never obey it. That is enough. Relating a final story of faith, Baba spelled out. Why did Hafiz say what he said? Once Hafiz's master, Atar, ordered one of his disciples to go home and kill his child. Hafiz was present and heard the order and began to wonder. But the man to whom the order was given simply thought there must be some good reason for it. So he at once went home, killed the child, and brought yep. his body to his master. All the time, Hafiz was having doubts. 
but he said nothing. Others were thinking the same thing, but they also said nothing. The master told Hafez to take the body of the child far away and bury it deep. Hafez did so. And according to the Persian custom, lit a candle and placed it over the grave. As he looked at the flame of the candle, he heard a voice saying, I have been benefited. It is for my own good. To his astonishment, he saw the form of a child rise out of the candle flame. As Hafez stared in amazement, he saw millions of child forms rising out of the candle flame. Aghast, Hafez went running back to the master. On his way, wherever he looked, he saw the forms of children until he came and sat near the master. Uh, can someone please mute? It's not muted. The master then told the father of the child, go and bring the child who is at home. The man went at once without stopping to think that he had killed the child. And even Hafez did not question, did not ask questions anymore. The man found the child, found his child walking around the house quite well and happy. The incident convinced Hafez of the tremendous powers of the master and his working, which is always mysterious <clears throat> and cannot be grasped by the intellect, and so misleads people. From that day on, his faith in his master increased tremendously. After Hafez got realization, he wrote, quotes, I failed my master, but that man did not fail him. And yet that man was not in his circle and did not gain realization. And then he wrote, he is the select one who believes without question and obeys with whatever his master says. So when I tell you to do something unusual, it is always for your own good. If you do anything on your own, which is out of the ordinary, you are bound by it. But the one who is beyond good and evil can never get you bound. He uses Maya to draw you out of Maya. It is as if when you are having a long, beautiful dream, you must have a short, shocking dream to wake you up. Delia said, sometimes when I have undesirable thoughts, I think that Baba knows them and I try to stop them by using my mind blank. Even now, if Baba does not break his silence in September, I will not think about it because some mystery and definite purpose lies behind your every action. Baba was pleased and gestured, yes, you have now understood. Herbert and Pendu left for Paris on Friday, 21st July, 1933. Two days later, Pendu went to Genoa and Herbert went on to London. Baba left Portofino on 24th July and went to Genoa from where he sailed that same day on the Victoria to Bombay. For his lovers, Separation was exceptionally painful this time, age-related. As this has been their longest stay with Baba to date, they had been brought much closer to him. And the closer they came, the more acute and painful the separation. 
They had been with Baba for almost a month, staying with him under the same roof in the same place, drinking the nectar of his divine company and love, which was poured into their hearts every second. They had also had a taste of the master's ways of working by harmoniously bringing different temperaments together and had experienced some of the ways in which he trained individuals to follow his orders by subduing the mind in a way that only the master of perfection can. Baba assured them of his early return and allotted them various duties so that they might always remember him in his absence. He also instructed that he wished for as many of them as possible to live together until he returned. Baba had enjoyed his stay at Portofino very much and its place in spiritual history is assured. Portofino will one day be like Vrindavan, a sacred spot associated with Lord Krishna. Footnote. He's muted. Lord Krishna was born and lived in Mutura in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. During Krishna's advent, his gopis, the women disciples, live some miles away in Vrindavan. Baba had given his company to his western gopis, and the beaches in Portofino are saturated with their tears. Quotes, Baba's smile, his splendor, his working, and Leela are there, said age. His lovers will surely journey there on pilgrimage to pay homage to the memory of his visit. Elizabeth expressed the feelings of all when she wrote to Baba after returning to America on 3rd August, 1933. Dearest Baba, you have left us outwardly, but inwardly. If someone's not muted. Can you please mute? Dearest Baba, you have left us outwardly, but inwardly you were never more near to us. And we talk of you constantly and dream of you each night. You are the realization of all our dreams and the joy of our waking moments. Portofino will ever remain with our hearts as paradise. How good you were and how loving. My heart is full of love for you, Baba dear. Baba's cabin on the Victoria was again small and the voyage was additionally uncomfortable because the Arabian Sea was very rough. The boat was tossed about like a toy and Chanji became violently seasick. Baba was confined to his cabin for most of the journey, but when he did venture out on deck for a walk, some curious Parsi passengers tried to meet him. The Mandali, however, prevented it. After a 10 day journey, they arrived in Bombay at 8 a.m. on Friday, 4th August, 1933. They were met by Baba's brother, Bairam, and Naval Talati, Memo, Rustam, Fraini, Gulmai, and Adi Sr., along with Marker, appeared on board a half hour later. Footnote. Rustam had returned to India from America and China on the Naldara on the 16th of June, 1933. 
Baba went with him to Naval and Dina's home. Okay, thanks, Rosalie. I think we have time for somebody to, to read maybe another page or so. Uh, Jay or Meher, would you like to? Yeah, I can read. Okay, go right ahead. At nine in the evening, after seeing Manekji and Banubai, confectioner, and having dinner at Nauroji Dada Chanji's Baba left by train for Nasik, where he arrived late that night. Once Baba returned to Nasik, he resumed his usual activities. Both the men and women Mandali were very happy to have him back and accorded him a hearty reception. <clears throat> the women Mandali consisted of Mehra, Mani, Naja, Big Korshad, Sunamasi, her daughter, Small Korshad, Dolly, and Walu. Piramai and her daughter, Silla, were also with them, but since her husband, Hormzud, had died in a car accident in May, they would sometimes go to Karachi to attend to family matters. Mehra's mother, Daulat Mai, was staying with her other daughter, Freni, in Nasik and keeping silence as ordered by Baba. There were also families of Baba's close lovers staying nearby. Gulmai, Dina Talati, Ramju's wife, Katija, and her sister, Haza. The men Mandli at Nasik were Chanji, Chagan, Gustadji, Masaji, Padri, Pendu, Ramju, Rao Saheb, Rustam, Sailor, Sidhu, Adisar, and Vishnu, Neval, Talati, and Nauroji Dada Chanji were also staying in Nasik at this time. With news of Meher Baba's return to India, people came from far and wide for his darshan. At times, Baba would see them. At other times, he would not. Among the visitors were Angal Pleader on 5th August, and Manekar and R.D. Karmakar from Dulia on the 9th. Footnote, Karmakar was an engineer and friend of Kalamamas. He had met Baba at Gaius Manzil in Nasik, January 1930. In order to be alone with the man Mandali for one day, on 10th August, Baba went with them to Khandala for private discussions and a day of good food, music, and relaxation. On Sunday, 20th August 1933, many visitors came to Nasik, including Kale Mama and his son in law, Rao Saab Pandit, Munshi Ji, and Bashir. Munshi Ji was a dear and special lover of Baba, who held on to his feet like till the last. Being old and childless, Munshi Ji had adopted a boy named Bashir, who used to accompany him where he when he visited Baba. On this occasion, the boy was acting a bit odd, but Baba lovingly made him sit by his side while he addressed the mandali. Bashir's state is unequated. He remains quite detached from worldly things. You people have been with me for years and still demand clothes, soap, razor, blades, and a dozen other things. If his present state of retirement lasts, Bashir will one day gain salvation through my grace. He will then have achieved the aim of his life. Okay. <clears throat> Well, that brings us to 12 noon here. Um, you know what? I think we can, why don't you read one more page? Go ahead. I have a question. I have a question. It's something sure. I want to remember. Uh, uh, when that person asked about a sex of the value and then Baba, I just want to get one line straight because uh, USA is so materialist. 
focus. If you think you are expressing love through the sex act, you are sadly mistaken. Was that the line or was it through, um, if you think you are expressing true love? Does anyone remember or uh, can we possibly get back to that line? It's, uh, it's uh, a PDF. Well, I just put PDF Portofino 1933. Does anyone have recall? Hold it a second, a second. It's valuable. All right, yeah. First of all, we, I needed to stop the recording because this shouldn't be on 